Hi, I'm Jim W6LG, your ham radio Elmer here in Rockland, California. Welcome to my radio room. There's an interesting article in QST uh, for March, uh, what is this, 2024, and it's on page um, 32 or 33, and it's written by uh, Larry, W-A-0-Q-Z-Y. Uh, let me um larry's background which is um pretty extensive so i'm not going to do a lot of um using of the arrl magazine because of a copyright issue but i i don't think they'll mind if i tell you why um uh, larry wa0qzy is an expert Larry is an IEEE senior life member, was first licensed in 1966. Larry got you beat by a couple of years. He earned a BS degree, an MSEE degree from the University of Missouri uh, in 1973 and 75, respectively. Um, it, Larry's first job was uh, with Collins Radio. Uh, clearly, Larry is an expert on, on the subject we can pretty much take to the bank what he writes. I'm going to disagree with a few things that doesn't say he's said it wrong. I just maybe don't like the wording or maybe I don't understand. Uh, and that occurs in the first couple of paragraphs. What do you need to know? That's what we're going to discuss here. I'm going to go into common mode currents and differential currents um, in trying to explain what goes on on an antenna and why you do need to have a choke at the feed point. I always do it, and I think you should always do it too. So here we go. Larry says, when it comes to HF antennas, regardless of the type of feed line, one dipole egg, and I'm gonna stop there. Um, not all HF antennas are dipoles, so um, I would have, said when it comes to dipole HF antennas or something like that. One dipole leg may be closer to things like the ground, a tree, or a building. See the lead image. Coax-fed HF antennas are also inherently unbalanced because one side of the antenna goes to the coaxial braid or shield and the other goes to the center conductor. Um, that's all I, I agree with all of that except that a dipole to me is inherently uh, a balanced antenna it can become unbalanced based upon its installation i think that's what he's saying these factors and balance occurrence flowing in the legs of the antenna um don't like the term legs but in the um uh, wires of wires of the antenna uh, and in the feed line. Uh, Larry goes on to say, in this article, I will use coax-fed antennas as an example to il illustrate the concept. Um, so uh, he's going to stick with uh, coax because uh, ladder line, window line, uh, parallel feeds don't have the issues that coax does. And besides that, coax is, is used uh, in most installations when current in the shield and the current center conductor of the coax is not balanced the difference is referred to as common mode current the other current that's going on there is um, uh, uh, differential current so it's either common mode or differential and that's all we need to know differentials on the inside one's balanced against the other uh, if they become unbalanced, it produces common mode currents, and that's going to flow down the outside of the shield. Uh, see, radiation from un from balanced currents cancels out uh, cancels outside of the coax, but unbalanced common mode currents flowing uh, between the antenna and the transmitter produce radiation. In other words, pretty much any I think he's saying pretty much any HF antenna is going to have common mode currents. 
how can um, how can we maybe grasp what we're talking about here? And maybe the simplest way is: let's say that um, you're in a gigantic circular building, and it's 200 foot circumference because that number works out easily divided by four. And you're standing in the center, and there's a post in the center, and the post in the center has a, a circumference of one foot, and your back is up against it. And I say, okay, turn 90 degrees. You don't have to move very far on that post to turn 90 degrees. If you were at the wall, which has a 200 degree circumference, and I said, okay, walk 90 degrees, you've got to walk that 50 feet. So the inside of the shield, whether it is foil, braid, copper, uh, corrugated copper, aluminum, any number of things, um, that has a much larger uh, surface area than the center conductor. And let's, let's talk about what we call different parts and pieces of coax. Um, I am going to refer to the outer coating as the jacket. Some coax has a jacket, some does not. Mostly it does. That shield that we're talking about, we are going to call that the shield. The uh, material, if there is any, in between the center conductor and the shield, we're going to call dielectric. And um, uh, it could be any number of different kinds of materials. Some have more loss than others. It could be air even. And then the center conductor is a uh, can be stranded or solid. Can be any number of things. Again, could be aluminum with a copper coating. Um, could be copper. Could be braided copper, uh, not braided, stranded copper. Um, so let's refer to that as the center conductor. So we got the center conductor, dielectric in most, most cases, shield. And um, uh, and then the jacket. Now we we we're transmitting alternating currents. So when you key your transceiver on uh, ten meters, what's it doing? It's putting out AC, right? And the alternating current is um, if you're on ten meters, would be twenty eight million cycles per second. So back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Millions of times a second uh, until you let up on the key. Um, that energy travels on the outside of the center conductor and on the inside of the shield. Travels up the coax and back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Now, if you were using um, parallel conductors like a window line or something, then the currents on those two wires would be out of phase and one would offset the other so it wouldn't radiate one would cancel the other keep it from radiating in coax it's a shielded product um, and it's less likely to uh, receive a signal through that shield the shield can be like 98 percent uh, coverage now so we got 98 percent coverage but there's a third conductor that most don't understand and the third conductor is on the outside of the shield that also conducts you know, what am i talking about well on the inside of the shield the rf that you're sending up is really just on the surface and a few mils into the shield whatever it is whether it's copper or aluminum or in, in many cases braid uh, it's on the inside for the most part. There are currents that come down the coax, and they come down the coax on the outside of the shield. Again, just a few mils thick. I think it's 10 mils or something. We don't need to know how thick it is. So what are we talking about in terms of currents? And it's not mentioned in the article that I could see. There, He, he is talking about common mode currents. And again, he's an expert on the subject. So those are currents that come down the outside of the coax. Current going on the inside of the coax is differential current. So 
it's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And those are called differential currents. Now, the point he's making about um, objects up against the dipole is that it can upset that balance. So it's no longer, it can add a uh, capacitive coupling at the end and effectively change the length of that wire on a dipole. A little bit harder to do on a loop antenna or on a hex beam. Common low current. So what's what's this article about and why is it so important that it's at the front of the, uh, the front of the magazine? Um, common low currents can make the SWR look worse than it is. Uh, it can uh, send RF into the radio room, um, which can put RF on some cases on the boxes, on the mic cable, um, cause you all kinds of grief. Um, the coax becomes part of an antenna, it's really part of the antenna, and it could be radiating all the way down the coax, could be radiating in the radio room. It, it, none of those things are good things. So what can we do? Well, um, just had one in my hands. Um, we can put a, uh, here's one. Uh, there are these like this. How many could be, depending on the, the mix of things, could be 10 or 12. Uh, and I, I, I've measured that before in another video. And the answer there was 10 to 12. This is, uh, uh, there are different mixes of this material that's on the inside. Uh, it's a, I'm told it's a pow powdered iron. And this happens to be a mix with a number of 31. Um, this particular oh, um, uh, snap on B goes over uh, LMR 400. And when you do that, it's on there pretty good. You can also make your own. You can buy a series of beads that are not split, slide them on the coax, heat shrink over them, and put on a coax connector. You can wind a, a toroidal core and do some impedance trans transformation and have uh, maybe a second core that does uh, put a lump impedance on the outside of the coax. What is this doing? If there's current flowing on something, how can we stop it? Well, with a resistor. And this is, we're dealing with impedances um, that are more complex. We can't shove a resistor on the outside of it, but we can do this. So this is going to take the current flowing on the outside of the coax, that third conductor, because there's outside of the shield inside of the shield in the center conductor. This will stop current from flowing on the outside if you stack up enough of them. Enough of them, um, a few thousand ohms. So where is the best point to put these things? Well, if you put it at the wall end of the house where your radium is located, that length of coax is now radiating uh, RF. So you want to have those things at the feed point of the antenna. Larry in his article describes a way to measure uh, common mode currents with uh, a really simple coils around the coax and a rectifier and a, uh, I think he uses a 50, probably a 50 microamp meter. You can move that along the coax and see the common mode currents. I will just tell you they're there. And best thing is to just go ahead and put on a choke at the feed point. Now you can buy these, you can build them. Um, it's pretty easy to uh, to put these on, but they add weight, uh, but it needs to be at the feed point. So let's say you, you put up an antenna and the SWR on a given frequency is two to one. Uh, it's going to be sending common low currents down the coax. Um, they're going to give you all kinds of grief. Um, the 
point being made is, do you need to put a choke at the feed point of the antenna? Yes. Do you need to put a feed, uh, choke at the feed point of an HF antenna? Yes. A VHF antenna? Yeah. UHF antenna. Absolutely, if you can do that. And it came up because I built a jig to test a bunch of whip antennas. And I was getting some oddball readings and they were oddball because of common low currents. So I put a choke on the uh, on the RG8X, which reminds me, uh, what I did do was to wrap a couple of turns through the uh, a larger ferrite bead. And I did that because I could. And there's a point of diminishing returns, but it's several. So I, I passed turns through some larger beads because that's what I had uh, to stop common low currents. And it worked. Um, so let's recap something that goes on with antennas. A dipole is, in my view, inherently balanced in free space. When you put it up for real, one end may be up against the house, the other end up against a tree, and proximity to those two can imbalance the antenna, and now you've got common recurrence because you've got some SWR. Um, Common occurrence are a bad thing, so I want to choke them. I want to also have as little chance of common occurrence as possible. So I'm going to get the antenna as close to resonance as possible. And that's where the, uh, the uh, value of the impedance is R equals 50 and J or reactance equals zero. I want to get it as close to that as I can. Let's say I achieved that at 14200, which I did do on an antenna. But if I move to 14250, it's no longer 50 ohms. It's something else that's got some reactions. Again, common occurrence can be generated uh, on just about any kind of antenna just because of life and, and the way we do things. Uh, if the antenna was in free space with nothing around it, and R equal 50, and there was no reactants, then um, <laughs> that would be impossible to achieve. Again, I use chokes on every antenna. Um, I also use a choke before it enters the house. I know that's silly, because at that point, there's probably no common occurrence, but I just do it anyway. I hope that helps a little. The article in QST's March issue begins on page 32. It makes an interesting read. There are some things I don't agree with, but it may be because I just simply don't understand um, enough about it. And uh, this guy is uh, clearly an expert. If you have not subscribed, uh, please do that. I'm uh, looking to build my subscriber base. Uh, gives me a little more money each month. And right now, that certainly does help. I'm Jim, W6LG, your ham radio Elmer here in Rockland, California. Thanks for joining me in my radio room. See you the next time.